Welcome to the Cash Car Convert Podcast, episode number 43. You're listening to the Cash Car Convert Podcast with James Kinson. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Cash Car Convert Podcast. My name is James Kinson and I am the Cash Car Convert. And this is the podcast where cash cars are cool and auto debt is dangerous to your financial future. I'm really excited about today's episode because this is the first interview episode I've done in quite a while. And the other reason I'm excited about it is because uh, when I read this gentleman's book, I would have never guessed that I would someday have him on my show. And uh, I think even when I read it, I, don't even, I didn't even have a show. I was uh, blogging and trying to create a podcast, but never would have guessed that, uh, that I would have had access to this gentleman. And I think that's something I want to mention here is, is to take a moment and just talk to you about you know the benefits I've had from podcasting. I've been able to really connect with some really great people, uh, both in the podcasting community. I've uh, had a number of authors on that, uh, that I really have a lot of respect for that have written books that have impacted me. And I hope to have a, a many more on as well, uh, because there's a lot of people I'd still love to have on that I think would bring some really great content to you guys, uh, some authors that have touched my life that I would love to have on. So um, I'll certainly uh, be looking to do that going forward as well. Uh, it's been my pleasure to, and, and my honor to interview people like Rachel Cruz and Larry Winget, uh, both of whom have read, written books that, uh, that were quite impactful in my life. And today's guest uh, falls into that same category. Uh, his book is a, uh, a required reading material for anybody who goes to work for Dave Ramsey's organization. And uh, this gentleman was training in business, uh, doing, doing training for uh, you know, middle management types, how to get their organizations running better. And it was interesting because while he was uh, going about doing that, he found that uh, oftentimes people weren't asking the right questions. And as he put it, uh, they would write, they would uh, ask really lousy questions. And so some of the kinds of questions they would ask would be, what do we have to do to get through all this change, right? Or when is somebody else going to, uh, to train me? Or things like, uh, why can't we find good people? Or who's going to solve this problem, right? So all of these questions are really not very, uh, very empowering. And so uh, he came up with a better question and, and he called... The, these better questions, uh, the question behind the question. So instead of somebody asking uh, who's going to solve the problem, you could ask the question, what am I going to do to solve the problem? Or how can I engage to solve the problem? So that's the way a QBQ works. It's about personal accountability and personal responsibility. And uh, and this went over really well. So the author really had something that it started getting traction, and a lot of people were interested in it. They were seeing really good results from it. And so from that, he wrote a book, and it was called The Question Behind the Question. And he's since author, authored a number of other books. I'll uh, have a link in the show notes that'll take you to Amazon, and you can see all of his books. But I'll just name a few of them here quickly. Uh, QBQ, The Question Behind the Question, uh, which has sold more than a million copies. Flipping the Switch, Unleash the Power of Personal Accountability Using QBQ. Outstanding. 47 Ways to Make Your Organization Exceptional, and one he wrote with his wife, Parenting the QBQ Way. And John and his wife uh, have seven children, so they've earned the right to uh, to talk about parenting. And he's got uh, uh, some others out here listed as well. So I would encourage you to go to his Amazon page. Definitely check out Question Behind the Question, and then I would dive into some of his other materials as well. So without any further uh, ado, welcome John G. Miller to the show. Hi, John. Welcome to the Cash Car Convert podcast. James, thanks for having me. You bet. My pleasure. I always start my interviews off by asking uh, everybody, uh, what is the first car you ever owned and how did you acquire it? Well, okay. If you're, you're not over 50, I'm sure. I am. James. I am. Oh, you, all right. Then you might laugh at this. My first car was a 1962 Rambler. Three speed on the column. Seats, the front seats laid back 180 degrees, fun car, turquoise green, kind of, totally rusted out, upstate New York, Ithaca, where I grew up, a lot of salts used. Uh, I bought it for $200 out of a farmer's field. He and I dragged it out together. He didn't tell me it needed a new battery, and he also didn't tell me it would burn a quart of oil a week. And I earned the money at the grocery store, and I spent 200 bucks on that car, and then I bought the car insurance from Nationwide for $220 for the year. This was 1974. 
And I had that car for about a year and a half, and then it fell apart. Wow. Well, that's that's great. I I, uh, I always enjoy hearing those stories because I'm always amazed at the variety of ways that people find their cars. And I'm uh, a lot of the people that I interview who are very successful, they have similar stories to yours. They buy a car that wasn't very expensive. They had to do some work on it to get it up to speed. And uh, yeah, it's it, so it's kind of amazing that way. But it's always an interesting way to kind of find out how people... Uh, got on the road with their vehicles. So, uh, so I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. I want to jump into uh, to QBQ now, and I'd like for you to help me with uh, what is QBQ and, and how did you come up with the idea for this? Sure. Well, QBQ stands for the question behind the question. And if your listener was to turn us off right now, I will just let them know before they go, not that they would. This is all about personal accountability. You see, James, I sold leadership training for about a decade, and I sat in sessions with really good people, but I heard really lousy questions like, why do we have to go through all this change? And when is someone going to train me? And why don't I ever get a break? And who made the mistake? And who dropped the ball? And when will that department do its job right? And I listened to those questions, and I thought, you know, there has got to be a better question here. Let's call it the question behind the question. And I went out and taught it. This was 20 years ago, 1994. I taught this idea at a company and I came back a few months later. This whole, I taught this whole idea about turning the question around. Instead of asking, why do we have to go through all this change? Let's ask, uh, how can I adapt to the changing world? Instead of asking, when is someone going to train me? Let's ask, what can I do to develop myself? I called it the question behind the question. Came back three months later to that company. They were using it. They had shortened it to the QBQ. This was 1994. Here we are two decades later. And that's all we do at my company is we run around the country selling training, books, and speaking engagements on personal accountability in the QBQ. And that's how it all started. Wow. Well, I, I know there's no, uh, you know, there's no uh, loss of need for that uh, today. So you, you may have been teaching it for 20 years, but it's still very relevant and uh, something that uh, I know I need and I can think of some others who could use it as well. You say in QBQ that there are two myths around accountability. Um, can you tell us about those? Well, I appreciate you asking that because when I say personal accountability on this broadcast, people might go, oh, okay, well, I know what he means. Usually we don't. We we think it's a a group thing or we think it's something I hold others to. And those are the two myths. Accountability is a group thing, you know, so we come up with oxymorons like shared accountability and mutual accountability and team accountability and accountability groups and accountability uh, partners and all this stuff. No. A personal accountability is a personal thing. It's all about me. There is an I in team. Absolutely, there is an I in team. And the I's name is John. And when John asks, what can I do to make a difference today? How can I contribute? That moves the team forward. So accountability is not a group thing. That's the first myth. And the second myth I mentioned quickly is we we seem to think accountability is something I hold others to. My wife and I, uh, Karen and I have seven kids, and we recently wrote a parenting book called Parenting the QBQ Way. A lot of practical stuff in there, stuff we've used over the years, mistakes we've made, good ideas, principles, all that. But the key to that book is taking accountability as a mom and a dad for what our kids are and what they become and how they turn out, so to speak. But when we sent the email out to people letting them know the book was available, James, we got back a lot of emails saying, oh, thank you, John and Karen. Finally, a book I can use to make my 12-year-old do his homework. No, the book is not for your 12-year-old. The book is not for your 25-year-old son who's on the couch and not not out in the workplace. The the book is not for your 16-year-old daughter who speaks to you disrespectfully. The book is for you, mom, and for you, dad, because as we say on page three, my child is a product of my parenting, period. So personal accountability is not something I hold others to. It's something I do myself. So the two myths are we think it's a group thing and we think it's something I do to others. That is so true. Uh, I I can think of so many... Uh, places in my life where, uh, where where that is the case, and uh, and I need to get some accountability around my own thinking and make sure that I'm uh, being accountable, especially around my children. So I, I have three children myself, and uh, with a pretty wide spread in ages, so I've got a lot of uh, a lot of uh, parenting I need to do there. The, the next thing I wanted to jump into here is um, you talk about personal accountability, and I know it can be relevant to both organizations and individuals, but this is more of an individual's based show. Because so, can you take me through? Um, how being responsible and, 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 and having personal accountability benefits us in our day-to-day life versus the sort of the victim mentality. Everything I do 
and everything I become comes back to me taking personal responsibility, personal accountability. So what's the opposite of that? Excuse making, blame, victim thinking, entitlement. You know, why don't, why don't others do more for me? Bad question. What can I do to contribute to the world? Good question. We call that a QBQ. Uh, why does my spouse spend so much money? Uh, bad question. What can I do to contribute our financial sit- or to, to communicate our fa- financial situation to my spouse more effectively? How can I control my own spending and bad habits? Those are good questions. We call those the question behind the question. Uh, as a father, as a professional, uh, anything I do as a husband, everything comes back to those 10 magic words that have been around forever. If it is to be, it is up to me. All that means is when I look outside of myself and blame my spouse for our financial situation, or I blame my family of origin for what I've become or not become, when I blame my boss, when I blame my organization, when I blame my colleagues, I'm really diminishing myself when I could have said, well, what can I do to take accountability today? How can I recognize that my decisions have directed me to my destination? Life is not based on chance. It's based on choice. When I make better choices and better decisions, James, I go better places. I go to better places. And that's what personal accountability is all about. Enough of the blame game, folks. Let's say, what can I do to move forward? Let me just say amen to that. You know, the the thing uh, um, I, I really try to spend time on with my show and, and, and to various degrees is to get people to understand that wherever they are today, um, you know, about 95 percent of it, if not a higher percentage, is the sum of the choices that they've made up to that point. You know, they may have had, you know, a medical issue or a hurricane or something that's somewhat un- outside of their control. But, you know, almost everything that happens uh, in our lives and the situations that we're in has to do with the choices that we've made. So I really appreciate uh, where you're coming from there. You no, know, James, let me add into that something you said really triggered a thought. And the, the last story in the QBQ book is about a gentleman in, the, in a wheelchair who we, I'll, give, I'll, I'll keep the story short, but, you know, he was crawling across a field picking up newspapers because he was the newspaper guy and he had lost his ability to walk a few years earlier in a car accident. He was in a wheelchair but he had spilled newspapers out of his pickup truck and he went back to the field to pick them up. And when I asked him why, he said, because it's my mess. So a lot of bad things happen to a lot of good people. But the accountable person keeps moving forward, keeps asking, what can I do? And they make the best of what they have. And that's what ownership, personal ownership is all about. You know, there were two things I loved about that story. First of all, I loved the personal accountability of the gentleman in the wheelchair. Uh, knowing that it was his mess and he had to clean it up. But I also love the heart that your family showed in jumping out and helping because I don't know what kind of a road that was or how much traffic there was on it, but I can see a lot of cars driving by and not really doing anything about it. So um, that you know, kudos for you, for you guys. I'll give credit to my kids. I think they're the ones that said, Dad, pull over. We got to help that guy. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I love that. Well, you're, they're, a, they're a product of their parenting, I hear. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I'll give Karen the credit. <laughs> All right. So, um, so I, I'm a big Dave Ramsey fan, and that's how I discovered your book. And I know that uh, Dave has this as required reading uh, to his staff and, and recommends it to listeners. Can you give us a little background on that? Absolutely. It was a few years ago when Dave stumbled across QBQ in an airport. This was before he had any required books for his employees. Now I think he has about six. But I'm proud to say that QBQ was the first book he ever required his employees to have. And if you know anything about the Lampo Group, his organization in Nashville, it's got hundreds of employees. He's far bigger than most people think as a radio host. And they do a lot of great things. And Dave just recognizes that whether it's getting out of debt, you know, eating rice and beans, driving that clunker, uh, or anything else you do in life, the foundation is personal accountability. And so we've become friends. He's He's the only famous friend I have, James, except for you now. I have two, I, now I have two famous friends, but he's a friend and we t- trade emails now and then. I've been on his show about 12 times. I was on his Fox Business TV show three times before that left the air. And he's just a guy that simply is against entitlement thinking, victim thinking, the government supporting us, the government taking care of us, whining, blaming, and finger pointing. He's all about saying, what can I do? To contribute, how can I make a difference? Yeah, I think that's one of the things I really appreciated uh, 
uh, in Dave Ramsey is uh, I, I, I stumbled across his book in 2009, Total Money Makeover, and it really changed my life. It helped me get out of debt. My wife and I are driving cash cars. We've got an emergency fund. We've got our retirement going well. And and it really changed our lives. It inspired me to start this podcast, uh, as you and I discussed before we got on the air here. And he's turned me on to a lot of good books, but yours, uh, it's really resonated with me. As as I was telling you, I just recently uh, uh, listened to it on audio, and I think I'm going to make it a, a regular part of my uh, weekly routine to listen to that at least about once a week, because I think I need that little kick in the pants and that inspiration. Uh, the stories you have in the book are really great. Um, I really... Uh, uh, I really like Jacob Miller, not just because of his name, but I thought the, 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 the what he did uh, really was exceptional. And uh, can you share a little bit about that with the uh, with the listeners, and you know what your thoughts were about that situation? Well, that's chapter one of QBQ. And by the way, folks, QBQ is about an hour read, so it's not uh, some overbearing, scary, heavyweight textbook. It's just something you can breeze through. But the key is repetition. As we say at the end of the book, repetition is the motor of learning. Repetition is the motor of learning. James, you catching on? Repetition is the motor of learning, okay? I think I got it. But, but chapter one is titled A Picture of Personal Accountability, and it's simply about me being in the rock bottom restaurant, and I asked uh, for a Diet Coke, and they don't serve Diet Coke. And so the guy brought me my meal along with the water and lemon I said was, was fine, and, and he didn't need to come back. But this young man named Jacob Miller recognizes we reap what we sow. And all of a sudden, I felt the wind of enthusiasm blown behind my back, long arm of service stretched across and over my shoulder and placed next to my plate a 20-ounce bottle of Diet Coke. And I was so stunned when I asked him where, where he got it, because I, I, he, he had said they don't sell Coke products. Uh, he said, from a grocery store around the corner. And I remember thinking, wow, grocery store around the corner. I asked him who paid for it. He said, oh, I did, sir, just a dollar out of my tip money. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we knew what he wanted, and that's okay. That's called capitalism. But then when I asked him, how, do you have, how did you have time to go get it? You've been busy. He straightens, he smiles, and he says, oh, I didn't go get it, sir. I sent my manager. And that was a hilarious moment. I'll never forget this young man saying, I sent my boss. I mean, who wouldn't want to send their boss, right, James? Absolutely. So I've always looked at that story, and we go into great detail in the, in the chapter one of QBQ. But he could have asked, you know, when is management going to do more for me? Why isn't there somebody covering this area where this guy's sitting? Uh, wh- when are the customers going to learn to read the menu? Why don't they pay me more? Why did they cut my benefits? Why don't I get free health care? I mean, he could have asked all of these questions. But I think he just stopped and looked at me and he said, sir, what can I do to help you reach your goals? How can I serve you today? And that's, that's really personal accountability. And there's just, James, no way to be outstanding without being personally accountable. I wrote a book called Outstanding 47 Ways to Make Your Organization Exceptional. And it's not a book on personal accountability. It's a book on the different things great companies do, good stuff, practical, short chapters, But if you study the book, there's a theme. There's always a theme, and the theme is accountability because it's not about my boss being outstanding. It's not about my colleagues being outstanding. It's about me choosing to be outstanding. And in that story, Jacob Miller and the Diet Coke, that's what we call it here internally, uh, you know, uh, he was being outstanding. We can be marginal. We can be mediocre. We can be average. We can be good, or we can be outstanding. And that doesn't happen until I take personal responsibility. You know, that is so true. And I, and I think also you, you talked about uh, uh, serving others and helping them get what they want. I think that's also a key point in leadership. And so I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up. I'm, I'm a big fan of, of the idea of servant leaders uh, helping people achieve, uh, you know, the, the, the people that work under them uh, achieve uh, their goals and, and their dreams. So I'm, I'm really glad you talked about that. The, the other thing I wanted to touch on here is I know uh, the cornerstone of, uh, of, of personal accountability you talk about is this concept that I can only change me. And I think, I think that's a really important concept. I know a lot of us, uh, w- when we hear a message, the first thing we think of is, man, I wish so-and-so could hear this message, right? And we don't internalize it and, and, and use the QBQ question on ourselves. You know, how can I help, uh, you know, in a situation? Uh, so, uh, can you uh, explain to us what you mean by the cornerstone of personal accountability is the concept of I can only change me? Sure. Something interesting about personal accountability, everybody thinks everybody else needs it. We have a poster we created last year at qbq.com at our store. 
I'll just tell your group, your, your listeners, 10 truths of personal accountability. And what the first one is, out of the 10 truths of personal accountability, James, everybody wants everybody else to practice personal accountability. So when we created the poster that can go on, you know, organizations' walls as reminders of how to practice accountability, we needed to start with this thing that I've seen for 20 years. Everybody sits in my sessions or my daughter, Kristen, who's now in her 30s, she goes around the country working with me talking about personal accountability. She runs her own sessions everywhere. She's learned. I've learned as we're teaching it, the first 20, 25 minutes, people are sitting there thinking, boy, does my husband need this? My grown son needs this. My boss needs this. My other, the other department needs this. The president of the United States needs this. You know, wait a minute. Personal accountability is for me. And the key there is we ask groups, you know, who's the only person we can change? And most people don't even answer the question, James, because they think it's so obvious. Well, of course, I can only change me, but that's not really what people believe deep inside because they are trying to change their child. They are trying to change their coworkers, their friends. Managers are trying to change their people in this sense. They try to motivate them. Well, I'm sorry. Either you hired right or you didn't. If you hired right, God put the motivation there. The inspiration is there. You don't, you don't hire people that come to work to, to fail. They don't want to fail. You already hired a motivation, motiva- motivated person. But what you need to do as a manager now is give them tools, give them training, give them coaching, be with them, spend time with them, all that good stuff. So managers fall in the trap of trying to change people. We try to change our teenage son instead of saying, what can I do to be a better father for him, whatever. So we could go on and on. But the number one takeaway from QBQ, whether it's us speaking live or our training program or on a broadcast like this, people say, you know what? I've been trying to fix someone. I'm done. I'm done trying to fix them. I'm going to ask the QBQ, what can I do to change me? Fantastic. I, I really like that. It's, it's, that, it's that kind of uh, a question that, that people, you're, I mean, you're right. They just don't think of it. And uh, I hear about it all the time uh, uh, from people I work with, and, uh, and they're always wanting to, to make somebody else change, and they never look inside. And again, I've, I've been guilty of that myself, so, uh, so it's something I'm definitely going to be, uh, be working on. The uh, the next thing I wanted to, to uh, touch on here is uh, if people only get one idea from your content, what do you hope it'll be? Well, there's a couple things, but the first one is that the idea we just covered, uh, I can only change me, and it is not trite, and it is not obvious. We we get frustrated, James, in our relationships. You know, if only my wife, if only my husband, if only my my teenage daughter, if only my adult son, well. We, we teach in the material what we call the ultimate QBQ. And I'll give this to you for free, James, okay? All right. Ultimate QBQ. How can I let go of what I can't control? That question is so powerful. Only emotionally healthy people ask the ultimate QBQ. How can I let go of what I can't control? I mean, if you know somebody who's controlling, guess what? They never pause and say, you know what? How can I let go of this thing I can't control. And the minute they do, they bring peace to their life. They bring greater joy. We become more productive. Everything is more positive when I start letting go of what I can't control. And the inverse of that is working on me because I really can only control me. So that is the number one takeaway from our material. But then there's other side messages that are very important. Servanthood, servant leadership, if you want to call it that. Uh, humility. We say humility is the cornerstone of leadership in the material. Uh, humility is everything. Arrogance repels. Humility draws people toward us like a magnet, but arrogance repels. So even on, like today on Facebook, I posted an image that talked about you know the group, what what leaders say. Leaders say things like, "I made a mistake. I blew it. I was wrong. I'm sorry." And we're always trying to push those kinds of messages to the marketplace because, quite honestly, I think they are contrary to our world. I, I, I believe in being a contrarian. And right now our world is about entitlement and victim thinking. I want to be different. Our world is about showmanship and arrogance and um, you know the things that vaunt people instead of saying, wait, what can I do to lift others up? What can I do to lift other people up? Instead of trying to vaunt myself, put myself on a pedestal, what can I do to lift others up, put them on a pedestal, if you will, even though we don't should never really put anybody on a pedestal. So the humility piece is very big in the QBQ message. Very big. You know, in the Bible, Jesus said, 
uh, before we try to take that speck out of someone else's eye, let's take the beam out of our own. I mean, that's everything. And that's what QBQ is all about. And that shows humility when I start saying, okay, you may not be perfect, but I'm really imperfect. I better work on me today. That's that's fantastic. And, you know, there was something you said there that really resonated with me. And it's something that I've started to talk about a bit on my own show. And that is, uh, you know, we hear so much about entitlement. We hear so much about our government and people are disgruntled. And and I believe the way we're going to change that is is one household at a time. And, and it's exactly what's in your book. It's what it's what everybody needs to be hearing. And that is the message of personal accountability. Don't don't look to the government to solve your problems. Don't look to other people to solve your problems. Take ownership of your own problems and, and work your own way out of that. So I, I'm really glad you mentioned that. I think that's a really important message. Well, thank you. And, you know, in our parenting book, Parenting the QBQ Way, we have a chapter that opens like this. Uh, are cell phones a right or a privilege? Is driving a right or a privilege? Those kinds of questions. Do 13-year-olds really need limousines at their birthday? And so that chapter goes on to talk about teaching kids to learn to earn and making sure we're not raising another entitled generation. But before we even go there, we need to, as a mom and a dad, look in a mirror and say, am I entitled? Have I created entitlement thinking in myself? Entitlement thinking creeps into all of us, James. And it's tough to fight in this society today, but we can. And how do we do it? Asking QBQs, what can I do today to earn what I have? How can I contribute? What can I do to make do with what I have? How can I live within my means? What can I do to spend less than I earn? These are all great questions. And I, I agree with you 100%. And I, I've i also talked about on my show exactly that point about the parenting. I mean, obviously, we want to raise children to be good adults. That's really going to work best if they are in an environment where they know what good behavior looks like and they can model it. So um, yeah, personal accountability from a parenting perspective is is critical. And so, uh, yeah, I'm going to have to uh, pick up your book uh, uh, for parenting and, and, and give that a listen. I've got a four-year-old daughter and definitely uh, want to make sure I'm raising her right. So uh, so thank you for sharing that. Good stuff. Thanks. Um, th- the next thing I wanted to, to touch on here is uh, I'm sure you get lots of uh, emails from from readers of this book. And, and I'd just like to understand, you know, what, what, what kind of things do people tell you when they, uh, when they, when they reach out to you? You know, I'll be honest. I tend to get emails, not from the first time reader, unless they're wanting to buy something. No, seriously, like, like tomorrow, uh, one of your listeners picks up QBQ. Maybe they're a manager of eight people. Then they might email us and say, Hey, I just read your book. I need a box of 12 to give out to my staff and my boss, you know, I tend to get emails, not just from those people that want to maybe buy something, take immediate action, but from the person, James, who read the book a few years ago, and they want me to know how it changed their life or how it changed their career path, how it helped them get rid of a true weakness. Like maybe they grew up in a family where there was nothing but blame. They came into the workforce blaming, 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 but they read QBQ and they read it a few years ago and now they've decided since then, no, I'm going to not blame. I'm going to take accountability for my life. And that's the heartfelt email I get from people who read the book a few years ago, and they they talk to me about how it's really changed the way they live. And I really love those kinds of emails. And anybody can reach me, john at qbq.com. It's just that simple. john at qbq.com, James. I answer every email I get. Well, beyond email, uh, if somebody wanted to reach out to you in social media, uh, how, how best could they reach you? qbq.com. Just that simple. I mean, they can click on the Twitter. You know, t- At Twitter, I'm a at QBQ guy, that's my Twitter handle, Facebook, the QBQ. But of course, all you got to do is go to QBQ.com and all those links are right on the homepage now for social media. Well, John, listen, I really appreciate your time. Uh, I think there's been some wonderful content. Again, I want to thank you for writing a book that has resonated so much with me and and, and something that I'm going to make a regular part of my life going forward. I'm going to encourage my listeners to pick up a copy as well. As John said, it's a short read. But for those of you who might be thinking, uh, you know, it, it might not have enough information, and trust me, it's packed with lots of great information, and you're going to come away a better person, I believe. So, John, thank you for being on the Cash Car Convert Show. And, James, that's thank you. Let me do one thing. For the listener who's listened to the whole interview, right now, the first person that, that emails me, john at qbq.com, tells me what they learned from this content today and gives me their mailing address, I will send them an autographed QBQ book. The first person and the only person. So you got to be first. Guy, I appreciate that. My listeners do as well. Thank you for sharing. You're welcome. Thank you, John, and uh, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you, James. Enjoyed it.
Hey everybody, welcome back. I just uh, was really pleased to have John on the show. Uh, it was my honor to speak with him and, uh, and and to talk to somebody who's had such an impact on so many people. And I love the idea that, that you know, he, he listened to what people were saying. He knew that they weren't reacting and asking the kinds of questions that needed to be asked. And he developed a way to help them do that. And I have so much respect for people who who take on things and look at them just a little bit differently. So I'm really pleased that he was on. And I'm not going to do uh, too much more discussion about what he did and what he said, because I think he covered it really well. Although we do know repetition is the key. So I will be listening to QBQ uh, again very soon on my iPhone and uh, and, and again regularly to Make sure it's it's kind of like a booster shot to uh, to make sure I'm inoculated against uh, poor questions. Uh, what I want to ask you listeners to do is is to ask yourself better questions. Make sure that you're asking the questions about what can I do to be more a supportive a more sp- supportive spouse. What can I do to be a better parent? What can I do to be a better employee? How can I be a better leader to the people that I'm leading? Whether that's your your children, your your household, uh, the place uh, where you work, you know, you own a business or you're a management or Maybe you're a leader, you know, within your team, uh, just just because of your leadership qualities. Whatever that is, ask yourself that question: How can I be a better leader, a better provider, better spouse? Ask those better questions. And one of the reasons, especially if you're a parent, that I'm going to tell you this is important, goes back to something Rachel Cruz said when she was on the show, and that is, more is caught than taught. And I'm a big believer in this that people watch, and 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 they children especially, they're watching how you live your life, and if you're living your life without a lot of intentionality, if you're living your life kind of haphazard, if you don't clean up your house, if you don't clean up your room, don't be surprised when they push back on you doing on, on you asking them to do the same. You know, if you don't, uh, if you're not uh, doing something other than watching TV at night, don't be surprised if they're not doing anything but watching TV at night. So they're going to model your behavior and they're going to learn from you. So the real question is, what do you want them to learn from you? Do you want them to learn the kinds of questions that were being asked by the people before John introduced his book and, and introduced this new way of thinking? The, you know, why does this always happen to me kind of syndrome? Or would you rather them asking, you know, what can I do to fix my situation? What can I do to make a change in my life? Give them the, the empowerment by modeling the behavior that you want them to live. And I think it'll go a long way, not only in your life, I think your life will be better, but then your children's lives will be better as well. And, and certainly as a parent, we, we all want that. Uh, as Andy Andrews says, we're not trying to raise good kids. We're trying to raise kids who will be good adults. So uh, with that in mind, that's all I'm going to say about that. I got in uh, three author references there in a, in a very short period of time, and that's probably plenty. It, it, it's, a, it's a really important topic. And uh, again, John did a great thing, and I would encourage you to go out and, and buy the QBQ book. And I've got that linked up in the show notes. There's an Amazon link in uh, uh, in the show notes at cashcarconvert.com slash 043. And also uh, qbq.com is linked up there as well. So I'd encourage you to go out and visit John's site. Maybe reach out to him on Twitter. Let him know you heard him on this show and, and how much you enjoyed hearing him. And certainly anybody who wants an autographed copy of his book, please shoot him an email, uh, john at qbq.com and uh, include your address. And uh, he'll, if you're the first one, then uh, you'll be the one to get uh, to get the uh, the autographed book. And uh, I know I'd be thrilled to have that. So, uh, uh, so please, uh, somebody go out there and get that. It was a, it was very gracious of him to honor. And I want to make sure that somebody takes advantage of that. As a matter of fact, whoever wins that book, uh, shoot me an email. And let me know james at cashcarconvert.com and let me know uh, that you were the winner of that, uh, of that book. So I'll be very pleased to know about that. Next, I want to talk about uh, FinCon. Uh, that's coming up actually this week. So uh, I'll be uh, going to New Orleans on the 18th, and I'll be there the 18th through the 20th, and that's uh, for the duration of FinCon. And that'll be in the New Orleans at the Marriott there. So I'm really excited about that. Um, I'm hoping I'll uh, get to meet some listeners there. Definitely looking forward to meeting some of the other uh, bloggers and podcasters that will be there. It's going to be a, a really good event. Uh the gentleman who runs the event is uh, named Philip Taylor. He's a local guy in Dallas, so I've had a chance to meet him a few times. Really gracious, really nice guy, and I'm really uh, just super fired up to be going to this event and uh, getting an opportunity to speak. I'll be doing a podcast episode while I'm there. I'll be recording it, uh, but it will be live in front of uh, of some people, and I'm going to try to do some things to encourage people to attend. So I'll uh, be tweeting and posting on Facebook uh, what that is here uh, uh, this week. And I'm really hopeful I'll have a good turnout. So it's going to be very exciting. 
Also, while I'm at FinCon, uh, the Plutus Awards uh, will be awarded. And most of those are blogger awards, but there is the uh, Best Personal Finance Podcast. And I am a finalist, and I'm uh, very honored and pleased to to be a finalist. Very surprised, but, uh, but very, very honored. In closing, let me just uh, ask that if you're really enjoying the show, I would really encourage you to go out to iTunes and leave a rating and review. And you can get to that by going to cashcarconvert.com slash iTunes. And that'll take you to a website. And from there, you can get into iTunes. And you just click on uh, rating and review. Click the number of stars that you think are appropriate. And uh, then fill out uh, a short review. And uh, you will be done. And I will be (laughs) very appreciative. So also... um, uh, re- related to ratings and reviews, at the time that I'm recording this, I'm one rating and review away from giving away Smart Money, Smart Kids, the uh, Dave Ramsey, Rachel Cruz book, and this is an autographed copy. So I'm very excited about the opportunity to to have a drawing and give that book away. Uh, I'm one away. So uh, one of you out there listening will be the next lucky person to leave a rating and review, and you'll be in the pot to win the autographed copy of Smart Money, Smart Kids, which is a fantastic book. So Uh, I I hope you uh, would have interest in in winning that book. Well, I'm going to wrap up this week. Thank you guys so much for listening. Again, thanks so much to John G. Miller. Have a great week, everybody. God bless you guys. Take care.